Catholic political theorists who think that there is a major difference between, say, what we desire, what we want, and what's good for us, right? So one of the contentions that someone like Hayek makes is that we can't neatly distinguish between what we want and what's good for us, that we're not capable of making that distinction. And therefore, what the market does, and the reason the market is valuable, is that it aggregates all of the things that we want in a fair way, and then it gives us what we want through that aggregation. Now, some people don't like the aggregation. They don't trust the aggregation. They think that the way that the market uh, pools desires or wants is not fair. But there's a right-wing critique that says that what we want or what we desire in the first place is not to be trusted and that our wants and desires will lead us into sin or into evil if they're not checked. And that what's, uh, what we should do is different from what we want to do or what we desire to do. Now that is a, a very different kind of attitude to everything that reclassifies all kinds of different things that people try to do, different projects people have because it deneutralizes projects. It creates a question about whether a project comes from a want that is a good want or a want that is a bad want. And once you have that distinction, that totally changes your political theory in fundamental ways. So I think that's a, a big, big question you know, whether everything that anybody normatively says we should do is just a reflection of a want uh, and therefore all equal, all about the same, or whether there are meaningful distinctions between good wants and bad wants, between what we desire and what's good for us. Yeah, I I wonder, so, with, 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 so let's take this kind of a new right uh, of a Catholic variety. Um, let's use that as an example. When you say that... Uh, good wants versus bad wants in their case are these bad wants are they are they being judged as bad by the lights of uh humans themselves like individuals themselves what is good for them um or, or is there some kind of like a third party I, I guess god that they're actually referring to so when they say you know good words good wants versus bad wants based on what merits bad wants uh, as deemed bad by individuals themselves or by some outside force well, so I think in general, in religious political theory, there's an idea that what we want is different from what is good, right? So the question of what is good and how do we know what is good is the big epistemic question in religious political theory. So in some cases, you will have arguments that, well, God tells you what is good. There's a set of divine commands that are laid out in a text. And then there are arguments about whether you can interpret that text directly. Can you read the Bible and know what God wants? Can you read the Quran and know? Or do you need a certain kind of theological training to do that, in which case you need a priest or you need an imam to help you, or a church or some kind of church organization to interpret that text for you and guide you, in which case you need to be part of a church and you need to repeatedly go. And that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it would be, say, you know, the way that uh, it's thought about in Eastern religions, where God is not someone who puts down a set of commands, but God is a kind of uh, of a uh, the whole universe considered all at once, right? Or a kind of objective perspective where you get outside of your body and your uh, individuality and you imagine you know, a way in which uh, you might view all of the universe all in one go. Now, the usual Hayekian response is that because we are in bodies, we just can't do that. The fact that we're in bodies means that we can't possibly imagine what it's like to be someone else or what might be the common good or the good in some kind of general big picture sense, right? But religious theorists will argue that, well, you might not be able to know exactly what is, you know, is God or what is good, uh, that you can get closer to it or approach it through various different kinds of religious methods. And that can also include, say, philosophical methods, Platonic methods, Aristotelian methods. Originally, the different kinds of uh, you know, Greek philosophical schools were all aiming at giving you the good life through some kind of method through which you would approach this, this concept, the good. 
uh, in your own life as an embodied being. And a lot of Christians argued, well, those philosophers make too many claims about your ability to advance toward the good as a, as a person, because you are you know, just a mortal person who's limited by your body. There's only so far you're really going to get, which is why you have to not trust your own self-understanding and trust in what the book says or what the church says. Uh, but this question about whether there's a philosophical method through which you can approach this, whether you approach it by uh, participating in the right kind of religious organization, whether you approach it through reading a text or whether you approach it uh, through a meditative or contemplative practice or a theurgic practice, or even through the taking of hallucinogenic drugs as part of a Greek mystery ritual. You know, there are all sorts of different methods or approaches that theorists at different, in different parts of the world have proposed for how you get at this thing. The Hayekian move is to deny that you can get there at all and to say that therefore all we have is wants, right? And it's in this sense that the Hayekian uh, liberal is a little bit postmodern, right? Where all of the different wants or all of the different desires are fundamentally equal and there's no way of adjudicating except through something like the market process. And so that's the epistemic claim that Hayek makes for markets, that markets are the only legitimate way to adjudicate this and that any other way of doing it with a view to human values arrived at through some other sort of epistemic process. All of that stuff is partial and it claims to be impartial, but it's not really. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, I years ago I was uh, at this libertarian conference in, uh, in Chicago at De DePaul University, maybe. Anyway, there was a, a Muslim man there and he and he was saying that you know, uh, after hearing these people speak, you know, these various academics or whatever, um, it seems to me like libertarianism is just moral relativism. <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, no, no, I, I think you misunderstand. And then I, I think I even said, uh, which I think is so kind of ridiculous now, I said, no, because uh, the morality is that you can't be coercive. You know, uh, you, you, you can't steal. You have to trade peacefully. <laughs> like, OK, well, that's a very, very thin and kind of anemic morality. There's not much there. So uh, so I look back on what I said in response to him, and I, I think it's pretty weak, pretty weak sauce, as they'd say. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think a lot of libertarianism and, and kind of right liberalism is remarkably morally relativistic. And a lot of their defenses of uh, the way that capitalism actually kind of upends society does mesh well with postmodernism. Uh, I mean, yeah, the question that the right and the left is, are going to throw is, well, why is it that the market is the mechanism, is the only legitimate mechanism for adjudicating wants? Why is the market epistemically better than all of these other different kinds of religious and spiritual and philosophical practices developed over thousands of years that people have used to try to distinguish between you know, what we should do and what people want to do? Yeah, you know, the, the, the kind of basic... Uh, defense of voting and, and democracy, it, it's kind of the political corollary to defense of markets in that, you know, whatever people vote for, well, the people have spoken, so that's good. As long as there, there's no uh, fraud there, right, you know, that's, it's justified. Just as in, in, in our private lives, the things we choose to purchase, well, it's justified as long as we didn't steal it. So there is, so from a kind of religious perspective, both, you know, uh, basic defenses of markets and basic defenses of democracy leave a lot to be desired. Um, Yes, yes. Uh, that said, you can find people on the left who combine to some degree you know, a conviction about there being you know, something good uh, with belief that that would involve ultimately everybody being able to participate uh, or everybody having access to time or resources because a lot of left wing thinkers are interested in some kind of principle of non-domination or principle of egalitarianism. You get a certain amount of overlap between a democratic or participatory commitment and this stuff from those thinkers. But you can also find on the left a lot of thinkers who are pretty close to the classical liberal tradition insofar as they also have a postmodern uh, sensibility. And a lot of people in that tradition are market socialists, or they're kind of in the tradition of someone like a, a Gores. So uh, let's pivot here to uh, your outlining of a type of intellectual or a sort of taxonomy of the uh, professional, the kind of credentialed white collar worker. Um, you have classified them as rump versus fallen professional. And, and from what I understand, the fallen professional is, is, is what Peter Turchin would call the frustrated elite, or um, rather his, his term is sort of overproduction of elites. And the overproduction includes a lot of these fallen professionals. Um, can you explain more of this rump versus fallen professional thing? 
Yeah. So, you know, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, when the argument was made that we really ought to manufacture all of this stuff in other countries where labor is cheaper and that people who live in the rich countries ought to be skilled workers who perform specialized knowledge roles. Right. That was the argument in the 70s and 80s for shutting down the factories and the mines and sending people to university instead. Well, what has happened over time is that as we've sent more and more people to university and we've given more and more people university skills, we have more people with university skills than the economy can support. Uh, we've found that we aren't actually able to assimilate all of these different people with university skills into the economy. Uh, at least we can't do that without gradually watering down the quality of those jobs, because if you have an overwhelming number of people who are, say, trying to go into the law or trying to go in, into engineering, the effect over time of this will be that companies will have more and more leverage when they decide who to hire and wages for people in you know, the law or in engineering will not rise like they previously did in the 60s and 70s and 80s when there was a premium for people with those skills. Instead, what will happen is that those career paths will become more precarious. A smaller percentage of the people who pursue those professions will actually make it in and actually be successful. More people will end up in more temporary, less secure, lower paying roles. And we've seen that with the academy. We've seen it with law. I think we're beginning to see it in computer science and engineering, uh, because as uh, people get it into their heads that they've got to get a college degree, that's the ticket to a good life. They go get the degree and uh, more and more people do that. You end up with more and more people chasing after the same number, really, of prestige jobs. So what uh, I observe there is that all these people who were told, hey, get a college degree and then you'll have a good professional life. You'll make your six figures. You'll be happy. You'll ha own a home. Uh, lots of those people are not getting that. And so uh, the, the fallen professionals are, for me, the people who did what they were told to do and didn't get the reward that they were told would come from doing all of that. So they feel that they are deserving and meritorious and indeed on the language of the you know, 80s and 90s about what a college degree should do for you and what hard work should do for you. Uh, they are meritorious. They do seem to, on the basis of that language, deserve things like six-figure incomes and houses, but they're not getting those things, right? And then we've got the rump professionals. That's the part of the professional class that has successfully reproduced itself and gotten into those elite roles. And what I suggest is that uh, a lot of our culture and our discussion is rump professionals who have made it talking to the fallen professionals who haven't made it, and that increasingly the people who don't go to college are not really part of the discussion in any meaningful way. They've kind of dropped out of politics. Uh, and indeed, in the United States, a lot of them just don't vote, or they have become uh, fringe voters, people who only occasionally vote, as the discussion becomes more and more focused on this college-educated chunk of the population, but this frustrated and, and upset chunk. Yeah, the uh, the kind of social psychology of being a fallen professional within the vicinity of the rump professional, it can be very frustrating. Um, you know, I introspection tells me that for one. But, you know, I, I wonder sometimes about, so you say that they're, you know, the non-college educated really are not even privy to this discussion and this, this dynamic, at least the the kind of psychological aspect of, of, of feeling like you're a failure or something. Um, I don't want to put it so strongly. But in, in a way, they're, they're kind of in this kind of uh, this uh, blissful, there's a blissfully segregated, not a good word, use the word, word to use there, but blissfully segregated from the, those kind of like dynamics of, of envy and status competition. Well, I wouldn't say that they're blissfully segregated. I think what has <laughs> happened is that the, the fallen professionals have uh, increasingly crowded out the traditional working class. So in, say, left-wing organizing, this is a really obvious problem. In organizations like the DSA, these uh, fallen professionals come into the organization and they don't really allow working class people to advance within the organization because those working class people don't talk like they went to college. So if you go to college, but you don't end up getting a good job, you don't end up getting a nice house, you don't get the economic benefits of going, the thing that you still have is the language that you learned in college, the ability to participate in the college educated discourse, right? And that means that what you tend to gravitate to are those rump professionals who will throw out different kinds of narratives that use the terms and language 
and are in the style that you became familiar with while you were at college. So you are gravitating toward that stuff because that makes you feel like you're still part of that professional group, even though in practice you don't have the other status markers or economic markers that you typically associate with that. So when fallen professionals try to organize along with workers, they end up getting mad at the workers because the workers don't know the terms, don't speak the language, want the discussion to be more accessible and uh, less pretentious. And so what that usually results in is that the workers are told that they're guilty of various different kinds of, of sins, that they're bigots, that they're homophobes, and uh, that they're racist and sexist and all the rest of it, right? And then the workers end up getting turned off by all of that, so they drop out and become less involved. And so I think that there's a, a frustration for the workers because whenever they try to do anything, whenever they try to organize, they're told that they're wrong for not having gone to college and not having uh, learned the language. Uh, at the same time, the fallen professionals are finding that they can organize and organize and organize, but their movements are minoritarian because they exclude the traditional working class too much. So the places where they're able to compete politically are very limited. And in practice, they're not really able to get very large numbers of, say, Bernie Kratz elected to Congress. And I think this is also going on on the right. I think there's a significant chunk of professionals on the right who think that the working class has a very, very strange set of quite right-wing views that the working class doesn't in practice have. The working class doesn't have the very strange set of progressive views, but it also doesn't have the very strange set of quite conservative or right-wing views. Right, but yeah. The professionals are, are disconnected from that traditional working class discussion. They don't have friends who don't go to college. They don't date people who don't go to college. They don't interact with any of that. And so they don't really know what's going on. They make guesses about what people who don't go to college value or think. Uh, they employ, uh, there's a whole industry now of trying to figure out what it is that people who don't go to college want and how you can get them to vote for a candidate. You know, this is, there's big money in finding ways to get people who don't go to college to show up at the polls now because the set of people who are fringe voters is much larger in size than the swing voters who will switch from party to party. So it's all focused around voter turnout. Yeah, I, I, I see progressives often um, sort of mistaking failure to be progressive as uh, being positively conservative or reactionary. Really, there's just a lot of um, just kind of muddling your way through, uh, you know, for, for the typical person, you, they, they pick up some, you know, uh, political um, stylings and attitudes and, and appropriate responses here and there. It's very disjointed and it's, but because it's not as cohesive and self-conscious as the progressive worldview, those progressives, those all those fallen professionals who are at least somewhat more adjacent to the working class often than the rumps, they will mistake the working class views as being right wing when really it's it's really lacking in ideology. And, and part of how you drive the you know professionals to vote is by causing the professionals to think that the other side politically poses some great existential threat to them. And part of how you do this is by presenting working class people as, say, bigots or as Nazis or as potential Nazis or potential bigots. So the professionals become scared of the people who don't go to college, especially the people who don't go to college who are white and live in suburban and rural areas. Right. And conversely, the right does the same thing by suggesting that, you know, that there are tranches of people living in the cities who are communists or anarchists and are you know, really interested in some kind of authoritarian left-wing project, when really the set of people interested in authoritarian projects of any kind is vanishingly small and mainly online. Yeah, I see a lot of the um, right-wing populism, in fact, being a kind of uh, liberalism on steroids. It's like, you know, like free speech, just, uh, just free speech anywhere I want it. Uh, this in, in a kind of leveling impulse, and, and you know the uh, the Fortune 500 is automatically suspect. A lot of it is kind of like a, a vaguely liberal, and 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 vaguely left wing. In fact, uh, civil liberties um, strengthened, and just like this kind of axiomatic, reflexive, hardcore kind of civil liberties liberalism. And so they're they're mistaking that as a, a uh, authoritarian force and uh you know i mean it, it can manifest itself that way but i i think there's kind of a basic misidentification going on of what a lot of the j6 people you know were about you know they they see trump as this this uh defender of all of these really basic uh kind of civil libertarian freedoms uh and not 
uh, a, a harbinger of fascism or Nazism. And in fact, they're out there waving Nazi flags, uh, um, or rather, they're when you do see a not Nazi symbolism coming from them, they're they're you're, they're usually targeting progressives who they think are totalitarians and the real racists or the real fascists, you know. So and they often think they can trigger people with that kind of stuff, and they like that. That's part of the online culture of flame warring and triggering. And oh, look, I got somebody to believe that I really do think this kind of stuff. A lot of it also is you know, the Trump stuff. A lot of it is 80s and 90s nostalgism, which is really nostalgism for the pre 9-11 world, the world that was made even more what it is by COVID, this pre-securitization world, a world where there were you know, much fewer uh, you know, efforts to, to secure the population when the crime rate was substantially higher because the capacities of the state to control crime were sub substantially lower than they are now. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot more crime, and there was a lot more crime because there was a lot less securitization uh, than we got you know, post 9 11 and, and you know, post COVID, and, and with the internet and with computers and with CCTV cameras all over the place. You know, it's really a, a whole different world that civil libertarians are missing. And it's a world of you know, democracy as it was understood in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, a lot of the. Uh... A lot of the uh, you you could you could sort of posit a uh, I hate the TSA to I hate the COVID security state pipeline. You know, um, a, a lot of people who are complaining of uh, the TSA and kind of post 9-11, you know, government machinations are the same people who complain about COVID lockdowns and all of that. Um, and but I think a lot of the kind of, you know, mainstream Democrats see them as as, as wholly separate. You no, know, like, no, no, it was good to resist TSA and Bush. This is completely different. So now, I, there's a lot of people who resisted TSA and Bush who then through COVID ended up coming back around to the establishment position. And so to a large degree, yeah. because COVID and 9-11 polarized differently, they have a complementary effect. Yeah, you know, Alex Jones in the 2000s, he did not have a reputation for being some kind of right wing xenophobic uh, uh, bigot. Uh, now, I mean, you could probably find evidence here and there for that. But but I, I, the general impression I got then uh, was that he was just basically somewhat enthusiastic civil libertarian. You know, um, he, he, Prison Planet was a popular website associated with him in the 2000s. And that's all perfectly, you know. I can't stand neocons. I can't stand TSA. I can't stand the security state. It's all very much in line with that. Uh, you know, Alex Jones is a rump professional in the sense that he's a media personality who's been quite successful, made a lot of money by you know, figuring yeah. out how to operate in the media space. And that's what a lot of these guys are. And they're positioned as if they're you know, political figures, you know, especially the whole debate about Tucker Carlson was very much of this kind. Oh, is he a political figure? Is he going to run for president? Uh, no, these guys are media personalities who are running businesses. And what has happened is that our political discourse has become very much an entertainment sector in which a set of rump professionals are making money and succeeding as professionals by leading fallen professionals around. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you know uh, the term rump professional, I think a lot of people, their, their go to would be some kind of girl boss or Ibram Kendi. But no, in fact, Alex Jones counts. <laughs> yes, he does He's count. Rump professional in the kind of uh, right wing new media sphere. I'd say. Yep, there's both right wing and left wing and centrist versions. Yes, you've got all the gamut. Yeah, you know, uh, among the uh, rump professionals, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting how the the right wing version of them. OK, so so the the OK, rather DSA, you mentioned the DSA earlier, not rump, but but fallen fallen professionals are to the DSA what, uh, you know, honey is to a bear or something. Right. They, they seem to gravitate toward, toward that. Um, do, do you think that's. The, the rise of the socialist entrepreneur is sort of an interesting thing. Uh, people staking out independent media outlets, uh, but from a left wing, non entrepreneurial general approach. Do you think the rump professionals of the socialist variety could be someone like, um, I don't know, uh, who's a popular, uh, Vouch? I don't know, a YouTuber Vouch. <laughs> oh, for sure. Of course. Um, yes. Yes, that is definitely an example. Yes, they are uh, overwhelmingly people who make good money, who have been to college, who have the markers of success. Those are the rump professionals. Uh, and there's there's a substantial number of them. They are the people who make the media content and they make left wing and right wing and centrist media content. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's one of them for sure. 
Yeah, because when I think of a professional, uh, just, you know, in, in my mind's eye, I, I see someone in a corporate office. Um, you don't really think of someone who appears to be doing something via webcam in their bedroom. Uh, but I, I wonder how much of that I'm sort of deviating a little bit here, getting into the kind of mundane specifics of how this stuff looks or whatever. But uh, I wonder how much of that is is for show. Um, so. So let's say uh, 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 as far as professionalism and in the way it, it all presents, um, let's take breaking points, you know, the YouTube people breaking points, right? They're, they're kind of centrist. Um, I wonder how much of the way that their studio looks, which is fairly polished and, and professional looking, I wonder how much more professional and polished it, it could be. Like how much of this is kind of an affect, um, you know, curious. Oh, so, yeah. Sort of a rhetorical question. I mean, I don't expect you to know. Yeah. Exactly. A, a, lot of, a lot of these guys, I don't know about them specifically, but a lot of these guys are constantly worried about the accusation that they're grifters. And the thing is, the right has had this kind of thing for a long time. You know, you think back to the televangelists in the 80s and 90s, you know, these kinds of, of professional figures who milk a particular kind of resentful person for money. You know, that has existed on the right for a long time. And in the right, it's just openly discussed as a business model, right? Uh, now it is occurring on the left as the left is, is coming to mirror the right in this respect. And so on the left, there's still a lot of people who haven't cottoned on that this is what's going on. And so you get this accusation of grifter thrown around as if it only applies to some of these people, but others are, are genuine or honest or are really doing politics. When in point of fact, yeah. it's not possible to get a really, really big following in a competitive media marketplace if you don't pay a lot of attention to what sells. And if you're paying attention to what sells, then you are grifting in the you know, strict interpretation of that term. So rough professionals are successful because they pay attention to what sells. That's a big part of why they succeed. And it's a very competitive environment because you know, as I said at the, at the outset, more and more people are piling into these fields and trying to make it in these fields because these are the handful of fields where you can make good money and get a nice house, right? So they're hyper competitive. And as they become hyper competitive, that means the people who succeed have to pay more and more attention to the instrumental side, to whether they're making good money. And that leaves them with less and less time and energy for thinking about, you know, am I really doing something positive here? Am I really accomplishing anything? Is there any uh, usefulness to what I'm doing? A lot of people are just constantly churning out content, trying to stay in the game. And when you're doing that, you know, what you are making becomes influenced even on a subconscious level. It doesn't have to be deliberate by the numbers, by what is getting you patrons, what's getting you clicks, what's getting you ad revenue, by what will get you demonetized. These incentives necessarily affect the political content that comes out. And this is the sense in which this kind of media landscape, this market media landscape, takes on something of a totalitarian character insofar as it greatly limits the kinds of content you can make because it is so overdetermined by what's competitive. And that's because it's so hard to break into this field, to these fields. There are so many people trying to do it that that puts uh, very, very powerful competitive incentives in place. If it was a less competitive environment where people weren't as worried about failing because there was enough market size for everybody, then people wouldn't focus on the market incentives as much. It would be okay to develop your own weird little niche, even if it's not that overwhelmingly popular. It would be okay to you know, develop something that might not be super popular and you know, gradually over time, maybe try to grow something out. But in this hyper competitive environment, a lot of that stuff is crowded out and killed off. Yeah, it's interesting because you know, I'll watch something like uh, Breaking Points or it's or it's uh, cousin uh, the Hill Rising, and uh, you know they'll 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 be doing something that's fairly substantial, like covering um, like a bill that will affect United Auto Workers or whatever. And then the next thing will be about uh, Russell Brand. <laughs> and it, it's clear that, uh, it, that 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 latter decision is really driven by just what is very, very hot right now. You could put a face on it, which always helps. Um, and a uh, side comment, uh, you know, there, there does seem to be a bit of a um, overlap between, you know, uh, the kind of attention economy clickbait dynamics and people who believe that who have a kind of 11th hour mentality and that, you know, everything really is, we are up against a wall and, and you know, this is, we're, we're in, in a crisis moment. So there's this, this dovetailing of, of uh, kind of a, an, an emergency ethos 
and um, what does well in the attention economy as far as. And it risk. affects all the traditional establishment media, too. I mean, we used to talk about all the time, you know, yeah. oh, now the newspapers are all racing to be first instead of making sure they actually get the story right or have a good take. Right. And now all of the newspapers and, and they're, uh, you know, they're all starting YouTube channels and they're all doing pivot to video and focusing on sound bites and things that have virality. You know, the, this is what the market incentives are doing. Right. So one way you could criticize all of this is to go, hey, wait a minute. All of this stuff is leaning into the human desire for something which is immediately gratifying. But that maybe isn't necessarily the best thing that we should use as our motivator for what kind of content we make that maybe you know, we shouldn't just pander to whatever it is, has that libidinal effect on people, that cathartic effect on people of getting the cookie. The issue is if you have a market system for media, it's very difficult to think about how would you in some way restrain or constrain that desire or prevent that desire from dictating the shape of the, the media marketplace. Yeah, I remember when um, you know the term crime porn was being levied at um, a lot of right-wing media. Um, you know, well, it's just salacious. It, it's it's low garbage. It's just kind of you know, it it, it appeals to our our kind of reptile brain. But now even the established outlets do a kind of crime porn of their own. It just will have a different flavor than the right. Like, oh, here's the newest, you know, uh, instantiate instance of a, a cop abusing a black man somewhere in the middle of America. They will elevate that. So. Uh, but that that kind of get back gets back to what I mean between the overlap between um, kind of clickbaity eleventh hour uh, or rather clickbaity uh, dynamics of what what sells and a concern about injustice that is just elevated you know beyond our what would have been normal understanding in the nineties or two thousands. So they they overlap in the sense that you know we need to see vivid video of you know, racial injustice in this country. And that also happens to sell because it's vivid and salacious. So they, 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 they I wonder if, if the theory of the kind of justification follows the material reality, right? So we're all in this, this super competitive clickbaity grifter environment. And now we have theory coming along that, you know, kind of justifying that. that yes, we'll, people will want to back rationalize all of it because right. no one who makes content in a grifty way wants to admit to others or to themselves that that's what they do. So everybody tries to convince themselves that the stuff they make is really political and really makes a difference. And many people sincerely believe it, sincerely believe that the stuff that they make is useful, but very little of what's made is useful. And you look at some European countries, right? Where the political content is in a different language other than English. So the market for the political content is much smaller, right? In those kinds of environments, you have more oligopolistic media. You have only a very small handful of media companies that are able to do anything. So the establishment media has a lot of control over the discussion. Now, that means that anti-establishment or non-conventional voices have a very difficult time breaking in. And those establishment media institutions can do a kind of cordon sanitaire and keep outside voices from even being heard. At the same time, though, it means that because those organizations are all secure and they don't face very thick competition, they can have norms about what they consider acceptable or unacceptable ways to cover stories. And they can hold the line and have standards about how do you cover something and how do you talk about something and what is OK or not OK to do. And they can have a kind of informal rules of the game that they play that constrains to a substantial degree their tendency to just follow those market incentives wherever they go. Right. But that's a, a nasty trade off because it involves embracing an oligopolistic form of media that crowds out a lot of independent and, and new voices. And so there's a question here of how do you have a media that is penetrable, that lots of different people can can speak in and be heard in, but also one that doesn't just have this race to the bottom and this emphasis constantly on libidinal desire to the expense of everything else, every other value that we might have with regard to media. Yeah, I think the answer might lay in uh, or lie in in, in changing um, the worldview of people in sort of prestige media, because even before this, you know, this super clickbaity uh, collapse of, of mainstream media's centrality, even before that happened, we started seeing uh, someone like Jay Rosen, you know, criticizing traditional, you know, so-called objective standards in media, the view from nowhere, wanting to privilege uh, certain voices. Um, you know, we, we saw a move toward advocacy journalism. So maybe the answer is just kind of changing the worldview of people who 
are in what remains of and in, in Europe are in uh, you know mainstream media. So you you, you want to have a sort of sea change in um, in, in thinking there. Um, of course, the kind of market oriented right liberals will say, no, no, it's just better to have competition. But then, of course, we get that with the, we kind of get the, the the grifting on on stilts, you know. Well, what I, what I would say is that the way that you structure economically the media marketplace tends to give rise to this behavior very heavily, right? It's the fact that in the United States you have this huge media marketplace that allowed so many voices to get going in the first place of so many different kinds and varieties. You know, and it's because in the United States that you could run these big cable news channels that could challenge the you know, newspapers and the traditional networks, that you could break this thing open and have all this different stuff get going, right? And in the European markets that are smaller, there wasn't as much space for startups to get going in the first place and to create this competitive environment in which you would then be subject to these incentives more so than you were previously. So the question is, if you're not going to just have a market dominated thing, I, how do you affect the way in which the people who run these organizations make decisions? Uh, well, you do that by structuring their incentive environment in some way. Uh, and that's that's very difficult. How do you structure their incentive environment without a market system in a way that is OK? Uh, what do you do? Well, the state is generally the, the thing which organizes these sectors in such a way that they operate the way that they operate. Either the state uses a market or it uses something else. Something else will look tyrannical to a substantial number of people, but the market will look totalitarian. So it's very difficult for the state to organize a media sector in a way that you know, makes everybody feel good about it. There's always going to be some chunk of people who aren't going to like the way the media is organized for that reason. But ultimately, the state has to decide. Yeah, I, I think this kind of shows the limits of, of market oriented uh, incentive thinking, um, because that is incentive doesn't say it doesn't orient itself, at least clearly uh, around what exactly is the crux of the matter. So at least what, you know, the typical incentive notion usually regards uh, monetary incentives or maybe a lessening of physical pain or discomfort. Um, but a lot of what's happening with intellectuals is kind of idea status competition. And so I don't know if, um, so that, that gets me back to changing the, the way that people in mainstream media think, um, incentivizing, let's say incentivizing to to allow more views, let's say on 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 COVID, the lab leak or whatever. What does incentivizing look like there, um, other than a more market competition or like a direct mandate to have someone who represents another point of view, like the old U.S. fairness doctrine or something? I don't know. What would that look like there? Yeah, you could imagine something like a, a kind of a state-funded, uh, say, streaming platform, right? Where there's some kind of algorithm that adjudicates, you know, who gets the money. You know, the state could run something like a YouTube, and then it could run it in a, uh, you know, uh, in a way that's based in some way on the First Amendment. And so it could you know, distribute money to whoever happens to get the content, but you know, with caps maybe on how much money people can get, so that you can't just get more and more and more money by being increasingly uh, desire-oriented or salacious. I could imagine a kind of state-run yeah. YouTube with hard caps on the maximum amount that you can be remunerated for content uh, and, and some kind of algorithm that distributes. Uh, and that could be, say, public and, and available to everybody to look at instead of, say, private intellectual property that is kept out of the public domain. And then you could have, say, uh, political discussions about whether we should revise that algorithm. But that is only going to be something people would trust insofar as they trust the First Amendment to really make that kind of social network uh, a, free, a free thing. And you'd probably want to start that off as something like a public option rather than, as, say, a, you know, a singular thing which would immediately displace all of the existing social networks. Yeah, I guess one might, might say, how would that not end up like NPR? Well, the, NPR yeah. is, is one you know, radio station. But I'm, I'm talking about if you started something like a YouTube or a Netflix, and then you had an algorithm which remunerated content creators. So anyone could create content for the state uh, social network or the state you know, video streaming platform, right? Uh, so not like NPR, but, but like a government-run YouTube with a publicly transparent algorithm. Now, the difficulty is if you are opening that as a public option, you have to remunerate the content creators in a way that's at least competitive with the way they're remunerated on, say, YouTube or Spotify or whatever it might be, you know, Netflix, whatever it might be. And that could be difficult for the state to do. Certainly, it would be difficult for the state to justify paying very large amounts of money to specific content creators, right? Uh, and 
if the state is allowing algorithmically you know, lots of different people to make content, then the state's going to end up sponsoring a lot of content that many people will consider offensive. You compare that to something like the BBC or NPR, where the state controls to some degree the editorial line, although it launders that through, say, an impersonal private entity that is meant to you know, be neutral or meant to be apart from it. You know, there's still you know, a, an understanding for the BBC, for instance, that the BBC depends on its funding from the state connect, collecting the TV licensing fee and giving it to the BBC. And so the BBC has to be concerned about how the state feels about the content that it makes for that reason. Even if the state isn't directly intervening, there's a relationship of dependence there. Uh, something like NPR, the state doesn't play nearly as big a role in funding NPR, but instead NPR depends on billionaire outside funders to make donations to it through their foundations, and that heavily influences NPR's editorial line. So what you would need is something you know, that funds it out of, out of tax revenue and then distributes it on the basis of, of some kind of transparent algorithm with uh, respect for free speech. And if you had something like that, I think you could get a, a reasonably diverse media ecosystem going you know, with hard caps on how much everybody's compensated. But for that to happen, the state would need to be able to raise enough money for that purpose to pay the creators competitively. And that's the thing that I think would be difficult to do in this environment where right now it's very difficult to come up with new revenue for new projects because of this competitive environment states are in where if they raise tax rates, then they have to worry about companies and, uh, and rich people relocating their money elsewhere. Yeah, I'd like to see a, some kind of lottery that selects, you know, kind of second tier influencers those who don't have a realistic shot at being among the kind of rump new media influencer types and then give them a shot at part, uh, contributing to some kind of uh, DMV of, of ideological streaming content. And I say DMV because it's, you know, people laugh at the DMV, but you will see a, lot, a greater range of kind of uh, left and right, random idiosyncratic views of DMVs across America than you will in, uh, in NPR. So some yeah, a lot of states do this a little bit with their film industries where they'll have, say, a granting you know, government board that will grant money or grant opportunities to particular filmmakers or artists. The trouble is that that board is often ideological and often has a view in a lot of European countries. It tends to favor particular kinds of people or projects that emphasize certain kinds of ideas. So you'd need something that was really out open and algorithmically open and transparent. Okay, well, I think I'll wrap things up here. Yeah, thanks for uh, joining. Thanks yeah, for thanks for having me. It'll be great. I'll, I'll be very happy to tweet it out.